Sermon 2, January 31st, 1916. The dead return with more questions in Sermon 2. They ask, We want to know about God. Where is God? Is God dead? Carl Jung answers the dead and begins Sermon 2. God is not dead. He is alive as ever. God is creation, for he is something definite and therefore differentiated from the pleroma. God is a quality of the pleroma, and everything I have said about creation also applies to him. But he is distinct from creation in that he is much more indefinite and indeterminable than the creation. He is more closely related to the pleroma than to creation. Moreover, he is the pleroma itself, just as each smallest point in the created and uncreated is the pleroma itself. After this, a footnote adds more depth from the Red Book. He is less differentiated than creation, since the ground of his essence is effective fullness. Only insofar as he is definite and differentiated is he creation, and as such, he is the manifestation of the effective fullness of the pleroma. Everything that we do not differentiate falls into the pleroma and is cancelled out by its opposite. If, therefore, we do not differentiate God, effective fullness is cancelled out for us. We begin Sermon 2 with an idea proposed by a philosopher I'd imagine many of you know, that being Friedrich Nietzsche. Jung is exploring just this idea found in the gay science, and thus spoke Zarathustra. To quote Nietzsche in the gay science, he wrote, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. A footnote found in the Red Book adds Jung's thoughts on this quote. When Nietzsche said, God is dead, he expressed a truth which is valid for the greater part of Europe. However, it would be more correct to say, he has discarded our image, and where will we find him again? Here bringing forth our previous sermon's illustration, we remember how the image of the one, say God in this example, is always changing form. The idea of God dying means the collective form of God, the collective image, is lost. This doesn't mean that God's essence is dead, but rather, again, its image or form. It is through the sermons and in the Red Book where Jung is attempting to provide humanity a new image. Now in this sermon, Jung begins by answering the dead, saying God is more alive than ever. You could see how this may at first glance seem to be a stance against Nietzsche. But what he is doing is rather speaking about the essence of God, whereas Nietzsche is talking about the image of God. And again, this essence of God Jung describes as effective fullness. This is important to note, as from the added section in the Red Book notes, if one does not differentiate God, effective fullness is canceled out. If one believes God is dead, they fall victim to their own ignorance and miss out on experiencing effective fullness, according to Jung. And because of this essence, we see how God is separate from the pleroma. Jung continues on essence. Whereas the essence of the creation is differentiation, the essence of God is effective fullness. Effective emptiness is the essence of the devil. God and the devil are the first manifestations of the unimaginable nothingness, which we call the pleroma. It makes no difference whether the pleroma exists or not, since it cancels itself out completely. Not so creation. Insofar as God and the devil are created beings, they do not cancel each other out, but stand one against the other as effective opposites. We need no proof of their existence since it is enough that we have to keep speaking about God and the devil. They are both manifestations of the non-existent qualities of the pleroma. Even if both were not, 
creation would forever distinguish them anew out of the pleroma on the account of their essences. Everything that differentiation takes out of the pleroma is a pair of opposites. Therefore, the devil always belongs to God. The opposite of God is the devil, according to Jung, which represents the essence of effective emptiness. Out of the pleroma, according to Jung, the first manifestations were effective fullness and emptiness. Now, if one contemplates these two essences, I'm sure one has experienced both in various forms and extremes throughout life. Life is full of highs and lows, full and empty moments. They are real forces of life. As Jung notes, we need no proof of their existence. They're in all of us. And in whatever subjective form it takes, the essence remains the same collectively. Here one notes the binding duality between the devil and God, as everything differentiated out of the pleroma is a pair of opposites. They cannot be without the other, as much as one would want to deny, say, the devil or God. This means in creation, in time and space, they are both effective. While this may be haunting to meditate on, it is a relief knowing when emptiness does become effective. It is just a part of the rhythm of creation. In addition, we remember the spell of the pleroma from the first lecture. If one strives for the good and beautiful, they fall victim to the opposite. In this case, if one strives only for God or the good consciously, then they build the devil in the personal unconscious or in their shadows. The only way through, that is, out of being spellbound by the pleroma, is remaining true to differentiation based on one's essence. This is that Jungian embrace towards wholeness and an openness towards what is. Speaking on what is, we remember from the first sermon how Proclus proclaimed that every plurality has a corresponding monad. Now, if God and the devil represent a plurality, it must have its corresponding monad. On this monad, which unites the devil and God, Jung continues sermon two. This inseparability is most intimate, and as you know from experience, as indissoluble in your life as the pleroma itself, since both stand very close to the pleroma, in which all opposites are canceled out and united. Fullness and emptiness, generation and destruction, are what distinguish God and the devil. Effectiveness is common to both. Effectiveness joins them. Effectiveness, therefore, stands above both and is a God above God since it unites fullness and emptiness through effectuality. This is a God you knew nothing about because mankind forgot him. We call him Abraxas. He is even more indefinite than God and the devil. Nothing stands opposite to him but the ineffective. Hence his effective nature unfolds itself freely. He is complete defect since the unreal neither exists nor resists. This is a powerful moment in the lecture. Where the dead came asking about God, Jung takes them another step higher. He says if they're both effectual, one in fullness and the other in emptiness, then there is something else that provides the fullness and emptiness through effect. And again, this is a God Jung says you knew nothing about which he names Abraxas. A rather lengthy yet important footnote is found in the Red Book, which helps expand this name, Abraxas. In 1932, Jung commented on Abraxas. The Gnostic symbol Abraxas, a made-up name meaning 365, the Gnostics used it as a name of their supreme deity. He was a time god. Jung describes him in a way that echoes his description here. Just as this archetypal world of the collective unconscious is exceedingly paradoxical, always yea and nay, the figure of Abraxas means the beginning and the end, because it is the life of vegetation in the course of one year, the spring and the autumn, the summer and the winter, the yea and nay of nature. So Abraxas is really identical with the Demiurgos, 
the world creator. And as such, he is surely identical with the Purusha and with Shiva. Jung added that Abraxas is usually represented with the head of a fowl, the body of a man, and the tail of a serpent. But there is also the lion-headed symbol with the dragon's body, the head crowned with the twelve rays, alluding to the number of months. You see here the symbolism of Abraxas is rich in both time or creation and duality. In its opposite and effectual essence, we note Abraxas representing the god of the world of creation, a god higher, say then, the Christian god of love and the Old Testament god which is feared. To continue our connection back to ancient Greek philosophy, Jung says Abraxas is one with the Demiurgos. While last lecture I used Plato's Parmenides to connect the one to the Pleroma, it would be right now to bring forth Plato's Timaeus to highlight the connection between Abraxas and the Demiurgos. I do just this as Proclus writes in his commentaries on the Timaeus, just for as the Timaeus gives responsibility for all imminent things to the first Demiurge, so the Parmenides links the processions of all entities with the One. Now on this Demiurge, Plato writes in the Timaeus that the Demiurge is an agent who takes the pre-existent materials of chaos, arranges them according to the models of eternal forms, and produces all the physical things of the world, including human bodies. We see how this is the same essence as that world creator, which generates and destroys in Abraxas. In addition, Plato adds, the Demiurge began to think of making a moving image of eternity. At the same time as he brought order to the universe, he would make an eternal image, moving according to number, of eternity remaining in unity. This, of course, is what we call time. And a further comment by Proclus adds, for the Demiurge, indeed, is the effective cause of time. Eternity is the paradigm of it. You see the effectual and creative nature of the Demiurge, a sort of medium that moves the world of eternity through this idea of time. And this matches Abraxas' symbolism of time and generation. Additionally, we see how everything created is an image of its model or paradigm. So to bring it all together, Abraxas allows the world of the Pleroma, or archetypes, to become. Psychologically, we could see this as the essence of which makes the unconscious conscious. Back to Jung, as he concludes this sermon, Abraxas stands above God and devil. He is improbable probability, that which takes unreal effect, because he has no definite effect. If the Pleroma had an essence, Abraxas would be its manifestation. He is also creation, since he is distinct from the Pleroma. God has a definite or determinable effect, and so does the devil. Therefore, they appear to us more effective than the indefinite Abraxas. He is force, duration, change. And with that, this sermon concludes with a brief introduction on Abraxas. As Sermon 1 introduced eternity and creation, it is Sermon 2 where we see eternity becoming creation through Abraxas' effect. Now before we head into what transpires after the sermon, I want to play a quick game of cause and effect to help bring forth everything we have learned thus far. We start with the One, which is the Pleroma, and all are nothing. In eternity, there are archetypes or monads in which contain a certain intelligence or agency, say a pattern. The effect from the cause of the higher, say the world of eternity, is Abraxas, which brings forth generation and destruction. That which is generated is an image of the higher cause and affects the lower, or the world of creation. Now, if we look at this psychologically, we could see how through the collective unconscious, the world of archetypes, an effect through Abraxas, enters the psyche or soul, say the subconscious, 
in which then thoughts or images are transferred through the soul or the function of the libido into consciousness in which the ego then receives its information. What is beautiful to note is the three mediums in this process. The cause of eternity goes through a medium, a praxis, who then has an effect which creates a cause in the second medium. That is the soul, which creates an effect into consciousness, say through thoughts or images, which then may cause the ego to then have an effect in the world. In this, you could see a chain of being to becoming or creation. And this chain is linked to many works, including Plato and other various theologies and religions. We could see how through this cause and effect, the unconscious becomes conscious. And you also know how if the ego or soul is corrupt, the truth will never come to light. Now with that, one may still be confused about Abraxas's nature, which I will leave for the next sermon as Jung has more depth to add. After this sermon, Sermon 2, the black books and the red book go in two different directions. I will save the conclusion in the black book for the end of this video, as it is rather a raw reflection of Jung at this point in his own personal journey. But it is in the red book where this conclusion will begin and expand on what just transpired. Conclusion As we remember, it is Philemon providing the seven sermons in the red book. And just as the previous sermon, Jung speaks to Philemon after the dead raised a great tumult, for they were Christians. Jung says, Pity us, wisest one. You take from men the gods to whom they can pray. You take alms from the beggar, bread from the hungry, fire from the freezing. Philemon responds, My son, these dead have had to reject the belief of Christianity, and therefore they can pray to no god. So should I teach them a god in whom they can believe and to whom they can pray? That is precisely what they have rejected. Why did they reject it? They had to reject it because they could do no otherwise. And why did they have no other choice? Because the world, without these men knowing it, entered into that month of the great year where one should believe only what one knows. That is difficult enough. But it is also a remedy for the long sickness that arose from the fact that one believed what one did not know. I teach them the God to whom one does not believe and to whom one does not pray, but of whom one knows. I teach this God to the dead since they desired entry and teaching, but I do not teach to living men since they do not desire my teaching. Why indeed should I teach to them? Therefore I take away from them no kindly hearer of prayers, their Father in heaven. What concern is my foolishness to the living? The dead need salvation, since they are a great waiting flock hovering over their graves, and long for the knowledge that belief and the rejection of belief have breathed their last. But whoever has fallen ill and is near death wants knowledge, and he sacrifices pardon. The amount of information in just one sentence from Philemon is overwhelming, so I'll try to keep my commentaries quick. What I want to highlight on is the idea of the world entering into that month of the great year, where one should believe only what one knows. The month of the great year is a direct link to Plato's great year, and this specific month Jung is speaking on is Aquarius. On this, Jung wrote in Ion, the approach of the next Platonic month, namely Aquarius, will constellate the problem of the union of opposites. It will then no longer be possible to write off evil as a mere privation of good. Its real existence will have to be recognized. This problem can be solved only by the individual human being via his experience of the living spirit whose fire was handed onward into the future. Secondly, to add on to this sentence, Philemon says it is a month where one should only believe what one knows. Alluding back to the previous sermon, it was belief where the dead were stuck, 
unable to cross the divided line towards understanding and knowing. This new age, according to Jung, is one where one must become a knower and leave behind opinions and beliefs. Hence, his notion of accepting evil, of striving for wholeness, and becoming individuated. Now, Jung, 40-ish years prior to Ion, still young and learning, responds to Philemon, It appears as if you teach a terrible and dreadful God beyond measure, to whom good and evil and human suffering and joy are nothing. Philemon, my son, why do you not see that these dead had a God of love and rejected him? Should I teach them a loving God? They had rejected him after already having long since rejected the evil God of whom they called the devil. Therefore, they must know a God of whom everything created is nothing, because he himself is the creator and everything created and the destruction of everything created. Have they rejected a God who is a father, a lover, good and beautiful? One whom they thought to have particular qualities and a particular being? Therefore, I must teach a God to whom nothing can be attributed, who had all qualities and therefore none, because only I and they can know such a God. You can see here Jung is struggling with this rather new image of God, which he calls terrible and dreadful. It is interesting to see his thoughts here, compared to the quote in Ion, in which he has come to terms with the reality of evil as a force in the world. And it makes this God, that being Abraxas, more indefinite and indistinguishable than God, as Philemon cannot teach a God with particular qualities or a particular being. Jung then asks Philemon, but how, O oh my father, can men unite in such a God? Does the knowledge of such a God not amount to destroying human bonds in every society based on the good and the beautiful? Philemon responds to conclude the discussion, These dead rejected the God of love, of the good and the beautiful. They had rejected him, and so they rejected unity and community and love in the good and the beautiful. And thus they killed one another and dissolved the community of men. Should I teach them the God who united them in love and whom they've rejected? Therefore I teach them the God who dissolves unity, who blasts everything human, who powerfully creates and mightily destroys. Those whom love does not unite, fear compels. And as Philemon spoke these words, he bent down swiftly to the ground, touched it with his hand, and disappeared. And so as Philemon disappears, he explains his teaching on this higher than God, God, in which Jung calls Abraxas, the ruler of space and time. Now a really interesting point to note here is this highlight to conclude on fear. Fear, curiously yet truthfully, is an emotion that will compel one to unity. Think about political propaganda. Fear compels people to unite. And here we see how Jung or Philemon says, if love doesn't unite, fear will do the job. This shows the power of fear, the power to move consciousness. Again, the leaders of countries or businesses know this, which is why they use it as a way to control the masses. So to answer Jung's final question, Philemon says, it is fear where people may unite around this god of Abraxas. And with this, the sermon is concluded. In the next sermon, Jung expands his teaching on the devil, God, and especially Abraxas as the dead return for more. But before we conclude this video, I want to add this conclusion at the end of the sermon in the black books. While it's a bit out of place, I believe it provides value for anyone doing the work. Jung speaks to his soul after the sermon. He says, My soul, if you are the intercessor for the dead, my God, if you hear me, end this torment that I endure from men. I can't bear it anymore. 
His soul responds, Come to us, to the green forest, the lonely mountains, the cold lakes, the sun and starlit night, to the clouds, to the mist, to the silence of eternal nature. May men be remote from you. No one touches the pure crystal that shines in a thousand fires. The human has fallen from you. You have come closer to the stars. The kingdom of what is to come will open. Let silence enter, the silence of eternity, since all paths, even the most winding, lead to the valley of silence. Leave everyone to his fate. You don't impede anything. You don't improve anything. You don't miss anything. You go to earth and heaven. You leave the clamor of men. You saw the fire. It is enough. Teach what is yours, then be quiet. You found your way. Do not ask for more, but fulfill what is necessary. You can do what you are able to do. No more, no less. So with that raw end to this entry in the Black Books, a lovely one to reflect on, we have reached the end of Sermon 2. I want to thank you again for watching this sermon and continuing to support this channel by commenting, liking, and sharing the videos. I look forward to the next sermon in which Abraxas's nature is expanded on. Until then, stay humble.